embarrassing Tomb Raider controversy just got even worse, existing as perhaps the most iconic and beloved female video game character of all time. Lara Croft is universally adored and hits all the right notes, appeasing both modern gamers and drawing in all new players to the gaming medium simultaneously. This has not only resulted in a dynasty of games being released, but even several smash hit box office Hollywood movies. So, considering how perfect Lara was, then this raises the perplexing question. Why is a new game being released that essentially features the Tomb Raider apologising for, well, Tomb Raiding? Honestly, you can't make this stuff up. Reality can indeed be more absurd than fiction, and this needless retconning not only kicks dirt in long-term consumers' faces, but also insults their intelligence and the ability to think critically for themselves. By the way, if you've seen videos on this topic already, let me safely assure you that I won't just be simply regurgitating the same article everyone else has mentioned. I have discovered something way more crazy than that. You see here, we like to dive in much, much deeper. People are in uproar about an officially sanctioned tabletop Tomb Raider game which, get this, seeks to redefine the Tomb Raider series in order to escape a history wounded by colonialism. Because... Nothing says fun and excitement like apologising for the imperialism of the past. It sounds absolutely riveting. Jokes aside, while this minor product is currently getting a lot of flack for the obtuse framing of the Tomb Raider series, more alarmingly, this embarrassing direction for a traditionally thrilling shoot-first and think-later style action-adventure game goes back further than the simple controversial board game. So join me today as we discuss when and why the Tomb Raider franchise changed course, and my own thoughts as to why I feel that not only is this direction for the series complete nonsense, but also pushing a curated narrative to suit those with radically different views who are attempting to rewrite history. And I don't mean just game history, I mean world history as a whole. Anyway, I am Lady Decade, and if you want more regular spicy content like this, hit that subscribe button so our voices can be amplified. Tomb Raider Nostalgia, a necessity for gracious living. Tomb Raider is my most favourite childhood franchise ever. Introduced to be mine by grandmother, my nan and I, along with my sister, used to stay up late on Saturday nights enjoying this quintessentially British gaming series. Nothing says 90s Britain like beans on toast with an ice cup of tea parked in front of the TV playing Tomb Raider. I mean, what else was I going to do? Watch Noel's house party? <laughs> I don't have positive memories of Mr. Blobby and nor does anyone else for that matter, Tomb Raider on the other hand is another story and as a result I can easily see why so many feel aggrieved with the direction that Lara Croft is currently being pushed in. Tomb Raider is our collective gaming heritage and it's incredibly disappointing to see it being meddled with. Speaking of our gaming heritage, aren't video games both old and new alike all the sweeter when we get to enjoy them for cheap? Alongside today's sponsor, Instant Gaming, I'd like to step up and help you get much cheaper deals. Instant Gaming distinguishes itself by offering the opportunity to procure video games at insanely low prices. After all, if you were getting a digital copy of a game, shouldn't it be much cheaper than physical as there are no manufacturing costs? Well, we think so. Instant Gaming and get all of their keys directly from the source, offering us authenticity without compromise. Using my link, you can enjoy tons of crazy deals on their website, which means, for example, you can purchase the faithfully remastered Tomb Raider 1 to 3 collection with 30% off. 30% cheaper than I paid myself when I bought the game on release. You lucky buggers. But if that's not enough for you and you'd like the chance to win a game of your choice for free, which one of my viewers is guaranteed to receive, then follow these steps. Visit my link, which I've posted in both the description and the pinned comment, make your Instant Gaming account and then select Participate to enter the giveaway. You can follow Instant Gaming on their socials and join their Discord to increase your chances of winning. As soon as the countdown ends, the lucky winner will be notified by email. Help yourself through these tough economic times by checking out the thousands of games Instant Gaming have for cheap by using the direct links I've posted in the description down below. Happy shopping!
While I can talk about Tomb Raider nostalgia all day, I know that's not what a lot of you are here for, and instead you're most interested in the modern drama surrounding the brand. However, when I refer to this as recent drama, a little digging down the rabbit hole quickly reveals that the pivoting of the brand started way before the board game that everyone is up in arms about. But assuming a lot of you are normies who are not chronically online, it's probably best to explain what this board game is and why it's getting everyone's knickers in a twist. Recently, a screen grab has been circulating on Twitter and other platforms which originates from the site TombRaiderChronicles.com. It's a circulation of the article featured in this screenshot that has spawned countless angry tweets, Reddit comments and spontaneous reactive YouTube videos with people giving their angry takes on what is outlined. Many would be rage baited by the headline reading, Tomb Raider escapes its colonial past. According to the article written on the 9th of April, it reads that British adventurer Lara Croft will transition from being a raider of tombs to a seeker of truth. It states further that the board game makers and the people currently behind the Tomb Raider brand as a whole are seeking to redefine the Tomb Raider series in order to escape a history wounded by colonialism. It's claimed that an excerpt from the official Tomb Raider Shadows of Truth RPG rulebook reads as Raiding, as depicted in the original Tomb Raider games and stories, involves going to ancient tombs and historical sites of different civilizations and acquiring artifacts. It operates on the assumption of Finders Keepers that grants raiders with the means and the drive to claim ownership of artifacts, regardless of whether they have any historical or cultural claim to the treasure. You know, like other offensive games and stories that feature treasure hunting, such as The Legend of Zelda, any Final Fantasy game involving looking for crystals, Crash Bandicoot and Captain Toad and his malevolent treasure tracking. We should cancel these f too, the colonial bastards. In fact, their next forays into the gaming world should be built around stories where they apologise for their terrible pasts and colonial sins. Who's looking forward to Captain Toad's reparation tour? I mean... Seriously, what planet are these people even on to want to change these fun action-adventure games like Tomb Raider into anti-colonial hit pieces rather than just letting established audiences enjoy them for what they are, innocent fun? But this is just a board game, right? Who really cares? It's a niche product and, although officially sanctioned, has the Tomb Raider franchise really devolved from a shoot first, think later Indiana Jones style treasure hunting adventure to a politically curated narrative commentary on rich white British woman bad? Make her sorry. Well, according to this article, yes. This is indeed the direction that Tomb Raider is going in. It adds that the board game's rulebook states, Later games released in the franchise have started the work of addressing this by having Lara Croft acknowledge her past mistakes and try to understand and show respect for the cultures and communities she comes into contact with. She has also worked to reform Raider culture and raise the awareness of her peers. Lara no longer decorates her mantle with mythic artifacts. As a Raider, she prioritises seeking out the truth. Much of this game is inspired by her humanity, struggle with heroism and her tenacity. We believe that all three aspects are an important component in creating a game that celebrates history and culture while acknowledging the respect and work required to live in a world wounded by colonialism. Honestly, this whole direction is so deranged, but sadly, if you know anything about the recent Tomb Raider video games, you will know that these excerpts are indeed correct, no matter how satirically ridiculous the quotes I have just read sound. But before we can get to discussing the absurdness that went down in the recent Tomb Raider video games, it's probably worth discussing the designer behind this board game and why they seem motivated to push Tomb Raider in a direction which is completely different from the one most fans will be comfortable with. After doing a bit of digging, I discovered the lead game designer's Twitter account, though the account has been completely inactive since August. However, I did notice that I could find this creator on Tumblr, allowing me to learn more about their vision for the Tomb Raider franchise. Amazingly, I found a one post from six weeks ago that goes into extreme depth on this very topic, so let's discuss some of it now. Honouring the franchise's history as one of the most important series ever, Ray Najardi, the game's lead designer, states, 
Tomb Raider is a franchise that has been around for almost 30 years and is a huge deal. It's hard to describe how much of an impact it's made on action-adventure video games repeatedly. Lara Croft is easily one of the most iconic characters in video games and the genre, and her adventures include several dinosaurs, wild transhuman demonic Atlantean stuff, and apocalypse-inducing artifacts. To be fair to this person, I'm in complete agreement with them on this part, but it's some of the following points where they seem to go somewhat off the rails, with them admitting that they actively are trying to retcon the game to suit how they interpret the world, adding, Anyone who knows me knows that anti-colonial design is in all of my games. It's just who I am, and it's not something I consciously did at first. It wasn't even until I started designing tabletop RPGs in my 30s that I realised how important my personal decolonization process was, and a lot of that has helped me discover new aspects of my identity, including being a transmasculine person. So I don't need to tell you that a franchise called Tomb Raider has some colonial implications, right? Well, no, I don't believe there are any colonial implications. I'm going to intervene right here before I continue reading the juicy parts of the rest of the post, as I want to address what was written. Coming from someone I'm sure you'd refer to using your style language of political buzzwords, as a woman of colour, I think your take is an incredible reach. Tomb Raider, like Zelda, Captain Toad's Treasure Tracker, and all the other games I mentioned earlier featuring treasure hunting, are all fantasy. Stories of humans treasure hunting in mysterious places, looking for treasure of all kinds of value, whether monetary or magical, is something that has captured the intrigue and imagination of the human spirit as long as history has been recorded. On this note, obviously while in European colonial times tombs would have indeed been raided, tombs have been raided for as long as tombs have existed. Hence why tombs were fortified in the first place and why the ancient Egyptians, for example, built mega structures filled with mazes and traps with the purpose of protecting the relics and treasures within from, you guessed it, Tomb Raiders. I mean, you'd never have known we evolved from hunter-gatherers, it's in our genes. I just want to remind you that the British Empire didn't exist during this time. The British Empire came about roughly three to four thousand years afterwards. The world didn't begin with European colonisation, no matter how much people like to chuck this around as though it's a fact. The world has been a place full of war and conquerors for as long as time has been recorded. It feels to me that Tomb Raider being tied to colonialism by this lead designer is purely on the grounds Lara Croft is a British character. I feel that had she a different nationality, the lead designer wouldn't have drawn this false equivalence in the first place. It's coming across like prejudice. Like, I doubt changes like this would be made to a tabletop game for The Legend of Zelda. Linking Tomb Raider and colonialism, in my opinion, and I've said this before, feels like looking for misery where there is none. And this is the deep problem when it comes to games made by these activist types. Next they say, as development goes on, folks have asked me, how is the game anti-colonial? Or, how are you addressing the colonialism? Now, this to me says that the lead designer has potentially spoken to people from two schools of thought. The first is from people who are, like me, wondering how they made that reach. The other from other people reinforcing this weird belief within a small echo chamber. So, let's see how they justify making these creative decisions. As lead designer, I've had to make hundreds of decisions that are reflected in countless design and structural choices. I can point to dozens of mechanics and things and describe how this is my personal attempt to present anti-colonial gaming. It's kind of wild, but in chasing after and reaching for anti-colonial design, I've had to figure out how to implement great tech from other designers, but also come up with lots of new stuff too. It's hard to feel like I'm good enough and can measure up to evil hat's faith in me, but they've been incredibly supportive and open, and it's been stellar. Now, I've said this before, when it comes to people with strange radical ideas, they more often than not come across as though they have rather poor self-esteem. It's actually refreshing and interesting to see someone actually admitting it, but that doesn't mean turning a beloved franchise on its head to suit a curated narrative is the best mechanism to change people's minds to accept their cherry-picked arguments. Contradicting previous points about respecting how important the legacy of the franchise is, they add, 
It was important to me that while we honor how awesome Tomb Raider is, we don't downplay the difficult truths of colonialism and its ongoing effects. And they were so incredibly on board for that. So, since this game was officially commissioned, this begs the question, who exactly were the people who were on board with this and would give the green light for this cash cow of a franchise to be retconned so severely simply for the sake of literally one individual's personal political beliefs? Because when you put it that way, this whole situation is mental. With that said, in order to understand how we got to where we are today, I need to give you a really whirlwind tour of the history of the Tomb Raider franchise. Back in 1996, the first Tomb Raider game was developed by Core Designs in the British town of Derby by a team made up of former Gremlin Graphics employees. The game would be published by Eidos Interactive, a company based in London, or more specifically Wimbledon, where the tennis is played. A franchise's beginnings don't get more quintessentially British than that. After multiple games, including the massive success that Tomb Raider would bring, Eidos would use some of their profits to purchase the California-based Crystal Dynamics, which was a spin-off from the infamous 3DO company that also made some of the 3DO's most noteworthy games. Moving to 2003, Eidos Interactive would publish the notoriously bad Tomb Raider Angel of Darkness, a game that was hilariously criticised for its lack of tomb raiding. Losing faith in core designs after this bungle, Eidos decided to strip core designs of the Tomb Raider brand and instead give Crystal Dynamics a chance with the instruction to get Lara back in tombs. Under Crystal Dynamics, the games were better received again, with another turning point occurring when Eidos Interactive was acquired by the Japanese role-playing giant Square Enix. Under their new control, they would rename Eidos Interactive to Square Enix Europe, with the Londoners continuing to open for Secrets of Dynamics and the Tomb Raider series. This would be the era with the Tomb Raider reboot occurring with despite changes to the series, this game being the best received in a long time. An equally received follow-up would soon come along after that. But the third game in this new series is where the sort of political ideologies included in the upcoming board game really begin to manifest. Rather than Crystal Dynamics heading this as usual, a French-Canadian subsidiary known as Eidos Montreal took the lead instead. This group would spearhead Shadow of the Tomb Raider whilst Crystal Dynamics worked on Marvel properties. One thing I'd like to point out is that this is the first mainline Tomb Raider game released during Donald Trump's slash Justin Trudeau's leadership reigns. This seems to be a time when people started getting really aggressive about their political ideologies on both sides. Oh yeah, and we had Brexit as well, which divided the public here too. It was a magical time to be alive in the Anglosphere. Development of Shadow of the Tomb Raider began in 2015 and finished in 2018, a period where everything I just mentioned had unfolded. Dismissing the franchise that he was tasked with building a game around, Eidos Montreal's narrative director Jason Dozois defined this as being Lara's ultimate Tomb Raider persona, essentially declaring his interpretation of Lara as far superior to all of her previous incarnations. He would state, we regard Lara as a classic, timeless character. It's not a period piece, it's always set now, so we have to use the sensibilities of today. The reboot has been about bringing a more grounded version of Lara. Becoming the Tomb Raider is becoming the ultimate expression of this survivor timeline, but what that means for us is becoming more responsible with the use of archaeology. It's not just about possessing an object, going into a tomb, everything crumbles, and then leaving is about learning that archaeology is also culture and history and language and that involves people. How incredibly condescending. While not yet as ridiculous as to use the game to attack colonialism, you can see the clear strides being made forward into this weird alternative and more pompous direction for the franchise. What's so annoying about this is that if people have these ideas and values, why not just make their own multi-billion dollar franchise without f with existing brands and dedicated audiences who they're trying to manipulate so they can push their agendas onto others? 
I'll tell you exactly why. These people don't have the talent or imagination to curate their own compelling stories. This is because they're activists first and creatives second. You can't fit a square shape into a round hole and no matter how much you scream, it's not going to fit. They can spoon feed this to the general public as much as they like, but the public will continue to spit it back out. According to Variety.com, they would report that the people behind this Tomb Raider game promised a narrative that will tackle the political tension at the heart of the series. I mean, what political tension? The tension that they made up? Again, looking for misery where there is none. It's sickening how these people think. Variety.com would then patronizingly add... At the end of the day, Lara Croft is a white woman who tracks down riches and artifacts in other people's homeland, and in 2018, the social consciousness surrounding those kinds of adventure stories has shifted greatly. This is bullshit, because in the realm of fantasy and storytelling, and let me repeat, Tomb Raider is just fantasy. Tears of the Kingdom was released in 2023 and is yet another game where you go around the world raiding tombs and temples, collecting relics. These people can't separate reality and fiction, it's mental. They go on to say, the new game is set in Latin America, ground zero for Western imperialism, and the company is at least self-aware enough to know that they won't be able to get away without addressing that paradox. Seriously, what on earth is this lunatic journalist even on about? This ridiculously dumb and completely factually incorrect comment serves as more proof that not only are these people trying to push wild agendas, but they don't even seem to have any awareness of the very history they seem to have a huge issue with. It feels like, as an outsider looking in at people writing with this kind of conviction, that their whole summation of history is just based on snapshots, cherry-picking snippets here and there which back up their ideologies and claims of victimhood. Speaking of which, let's talk more about colonialism, the very issue that the lead designer of this board game seems to have developed a hyper-focused fixation over, as they self-admitted on Tumblr, that they can't stop making games tackling the perceived issue. Unlike Variety.com's journalist's false claim, Western imperialism and colonization didn't start with Latin America, but instead in the time of antiquity with the ancient Greeks and Romans thousands and thousands of years ago, before Europeans even knew Latin America even existed. Even in the time of antiquity, there were more superpowers than just the European ones, such as the ancient Egyptians and Phoenicians, who were based in what is now modern Lebanon. This happened thousands of years before the Age of Discovery occurred. I can't even comprehend that someone would not know that. I thought the Romans, Egyptians and Greeks were taught in all schools in the so-called West. A lot of our modern languages and cultures are spread from the initial seeds planted around the world during this period of colonization. In fact, the Romans colonized parts of the Meds, North Africa, West Asia and even my home of Great Britain, a country that has been invaded, conquered and colonized like most other regions multiple times through history. Countless colonial empires would rise and fall before the Age of Discovery even began. None of this even takes into account conquest within the Africas by Africans, the Arab Crusaders, or even the fascinating yet confusing history of the Indian subcontinent. It's always about the big bad British Empire colonizing the huge region, completely ignoring the Maurya Empire, Gupta Empire, Mughal Empire and various regional kingdoms. Additionally, there were periods of foreign invasions and rule such as the Turkic and Afghan invasions, but I guess because none of these forces were white, less hatred is directed at them. All the British Empire did was pick up the pieces of a war-torn region, introducing much needed stability and centralized power. Now, just to be clear, I am not in the camp of pro-colonialization. What I'm saying is that it's extremely childish to try and break down world history as a simple battle of good versus evil. That's fairy tales, not the real world. By referring to oneself as anti-colonial, it's reducing nuanced history down to sound bites. 
The hard truth is that without colonialism and the human life toll it's taken on humanity over the thousands and thousands of years that nations have been invading one another, then we simply wouldn't live in the globalized and technologically advanced society we find ourselves in right now. You know, the very world where we can even have these discussions about what is right and wrong and worry about literally trivial pursuits like board games. Colonization, love it or hate it, likely allowed wisdom and knowledge to spread at a far faster pace around the globe than had it never happened. The world is a cultural tapestry shaped by war and tragedy. Many argue that colonial powers brought infrastructure, technology and economic development to many regions, introducing modern systems of transportation, communication and industry. Some argue that colonialism brought about social progress in terms of education, healthcare and governance, colonial administrations often established schools, hospitals and legal systems which contributed to social advancement in colonised territories. This all facilitated cultural exchange to levels simply not possible without it. Just for the record, I wouldn't even exist were it not for colonialism. My grandfather wouldn't have been able to come here from Sri Lanka to study computer science in the 1960s. He later got a job working for the BBC when they were located in Harrods operating their giant computers. He would meet my grandmother and start a family. None of these opportunities would have happened were it not for the footprints of the British colonial past. I'm far from the only person descended from situations like this too. Myself and other mixed race people are the human embodiment of cultural exchange. I'm literally a child of the empire. All the points that I'm trying to make is that really nothing is ever as simple as good versus evil and that 99% of us are in agreement that some of the worst atrocities in human history occurred due to imperial conquest and colonisation. But we all know this. Which is why we don't bloody need it shoved down our throats in a Tomb Raider game of all things. Don't forget you can support this channel by purchasing cheap games using my instant gaming link. Or if you really like what you see and want to support this channel in a more personal way, then consider backing this show on Patreon. Thank you and see you soon.